rule one, any story with a crocodile in it makes it to the front page, true to form... Monster 7.5 metre croc say police. Well, not exactly. Territory crocodile experts last night did not reject reports that a monster crocodile up to 7.5 metres long had been seen in northern Australia. Neither did they reject reports that Elvis was with it. And what precisely does... Up to 7.5 metres long... ...mean? It's a crocodile of some elasticity? At the other end of the same edition in the stop press, the NT News keeps up the standard. London. Actor Hugh Grant has confessed to having sexy dreams about Princess Diana. So much for the urgent matters. A small detail in this picture from the Fairfax Herald has caused us to reflect on media self-promotion. Quite possibly, you thought those all-in media rucks were about grabbing a sound bite, this sort of thing. One and a half billion is uh, welcome news indeed. In fact, this element of the picture is as important as the words spoken, the advertisements on the microphones. From time to time, as the station logos get bigger and bigger and threaten serious injury to the subject matter, the media agree among themselves to remove them. Another such truce is overdue, we would have thought, when even the wire service dictaphone is used as an advertising medium. And let me stay with this subject of media rucks for a moment. It's obvious that John Howard's media minders believe the jostling attentions of the hacks enhance their man's stature. So they stage this sort of thing. John Howard claims the Prime Minister is simply frightened of an adverse finding against Carmen Lawrence. But to attack the integrity of, uh, of lawyers who are doing a job is quite wrong. But the Keating managers think differently. This is the presidential style. Separate, distanced, ordered, commanding respect even. Now look what's happened here. After weeks of angry exchanges over the Marks Royal Commission, Prime Minister Paul Keating has called for it all to end. And note the journalists kept in line by the white velvet rope, like unwise diners who neglected to make a reservation at a popular restaurant. It's plainly going to be the PM's media technique for the election campaign. The electronic people can plug into the Keating microphones, but they'll be kept at a respectful distance. It's a measure that controls the images on the six o'clock news, but not the words. The Prime Minister says his position is not under threat. If you blokes take that seriously, we could sell you the Town Hall clock and the Sydney Harbour Bridge and a block of flats in Tasmania all rolled into one. The spur of the moment allusion to Tasmania, otherwise it sounded too Sydney or the bush, didn't it, was a red rag to the insular. Mr Hodgman said the Prime Minister had effectively claimed it would be as difficult to sell a block of flats in Tasmania as it would be to sell the Sydney Harbour Bridge or the Town Hall clock. The Prime Minister reckoned without Tassie's real estate agents who are likely to demand an apology. Why? On to plagiarism or to be legalistic, prima facie cases of plagiarism, which is such a serious media malpractice, we would have thought any practitioner mindful of Caesar's wife would take the greatest pains to avoid even the slightest suspicion of lifting someone else's work and the attendant risk of emulating Lot's wife. Not so. Here are some most unfortunate coincidences. Far be it from Media Watch to assert they're your actual thefts, just circumstantial evidence that more care should have been taken. Steve Cakebread's cartoon for the Fairfax Herald Stay in Touch. I say, don't get the new guy offside. I'm with you had the caption, Dicing with death. But seemed to owe a debt to Simon Bosch's bulletin drawing published 13 months earlier. Pierre the chef, Dicing with death. In much the same way, we saw a homage, perhaps that's the apposite euphemism, in Todd Davidson's drawing for the age. Not a very good drawing, I own, but unfortunately similar, similar, it's bloody well identical, to this Russian cartoon drawn by Igor Smirnov and reproduced as publicity for a Melbourne art exhibition in April 1990. Don't phone your solicitor, Todd Davidson. We're only saying they're strikingly similar. This one, though, is theft. Contributed by one Tristan Everett, Tristan incidentally means child of sadness, to the University of Western Sydney student publication, Jambana, and dealing with the McDonald's libel case in London, had these paragraphs lifted word for word and the rest paraphrased from Cherry Ripe's piece published a week earlier in the Weekend Australian. 
that Tristan Everett plagiarism included the Weekend Oz artwork by Phil McCormick, curiously and untruthfully captioned, The McDonald's customer of the future. Courtesy of the Sydney Morning Herald. Oh, no, it wasn't. Some of this lifting is done in the mistaken belief that oblique attribution removes the taint of dishonest journalism. Whether this article from the Sun Herald's TV giveaway gets away with reliance on another writer's work, you can judge for yourself. The Sun Herald's Linda Hooper, in a short piece about comedian Roseanne Barr, incorporates this paragraph. Here's a taste. Something has been murdered in her, and this is palpable in the timidity and detachment behind her eyes. There's a great deal more in that paragraph, and it is, to be fair, duly attributed. Noted English writer John La. La noted it in one of his major profiles for The New Yorker, a 17-page study of great detail, quite unlike Hooper's two-page fan mag contribution, which was introduced thus. She tells Linda Hooper of her master plan. Yet these quotes from Roseanne Barr were, in truth, given to John La, not Linda Hooper. And this part of Hooper's narrative was actually written by La for The New Yorker. The ethics are unclear to us, so we hope the Sun Herald's editor, Andrew Clark, will explain them. Is it that only up to one lift absolves you from all others? Or do journalists consider that if the subject tells one writer, she's giving the quote to every writer? Please explain, Mr. Clark. Here's another, and it needs no explanation. It's from Juice magazine, and it's about a television show called The X Files. Daniel Warren journeys inside the creep show and reports that truth is indeed stranger than fiction. Quite so. Daniel Warren's piece is studded with first-hand reportage. I get Chris Carter on the phone. I am in Mulder's trailer. I stand on a nearby grassy knoll behind the camera crew. I call him and search for the truth. There's that word again, truth. The truth is that Daniel Warren's Juice article is a determined plagiarism from US magazine, May 1995, and this article by Steve Pond. And not just from there, but also from Details magazine and Stephen Sabin's article from February this year. It'd be tiresome to go through them all in detail, but Daniel Warren's quotes belong either to Pond or Sabin. But this is a creative thief. The Steve Pond article includes this. I'm just trying to work it out as I go along. Duchovny says softly, eyeing the stacks of books piled high in his trailer. His favourite authors are Norman Mailer and Thomas Pynchon. Warren for Juice magazine. I am in Mulder's trailer. Well, OK, it's David Duchovny's trailer. I silently check the pile of books on the table, noting Norman Mailer and Thomas Pynchon. Must have been crowded in that trailer. And this is from Details magazine, where Stephen Sabin interviews the star. The X-Files know what kind of underwear you prefer, I tell David. Silk boxes. I don't wear underwear, he says. Daniel Warren for Juice. The X-Files claim to know your favourite kind of underwear, I tell Duchovny in his trailer. Silk boxes. I don't wear underwear, he shoots back. I almost ask, but does Mulder? Almost, but not quite. Warren's never met his subject, let alone interviewed him. This is a school of journalism that believes stealing from one source may be plagiarism, but stealing from two, that's research. Television derivatives are somewhat different in texture. They don't so much plagiarise as caricature each other and themselves. John Collis of National 9 News likes to see himself on monitors. It's thought most people will be happy to trade a small element of privacy for large benefits in public safety. In other words, fair exchange, no robbery. Even the Privacy Committee agrees they have a job to do. More likely from this review, a strict set of rules governing when and where they can be used and what happens to the material. Damien Smith of 10 obviously suffered a deprived childhood. It's a perfect day in Sydney, just right for a bit of fun in the park. But this is about as thrilling as it gets for the average weekday visitor. Well, the grand parade might be over, but you do get more chances to see it. And as for the rest of the show, there is still plenty to see and do. Another 10 reporter, Daryl Anderson, has ambitions of appearing on the internet. The talk around here is about doing business on the internet. And there are those who say it's a billion dollar opportunity for Australia. The days when the internet will be able to offer you a test drive are still a mighty long way away.
Perhaps he's been watching the 7.30 reports, Craig McMurtry. Operating system, the basic program that runs your computer. Multimedia, the combination of words, music and pictures. Hard disk, the computer's main storehouse for programs. No television idea is too silly to copy. He claims his athletic endeavours have helped postpone the need for two arthritic hip replacements by several years. Nobby maintains, as long as you've got your health, you've got it pretty good. It's Network 10 house style. He's already the fastest man in rugby league, but there is some bad news for the opposition. He's not at his peak just yet. It rained in Sydney this week. Many people are familiar with rain, rain coats even. But for the benefit of the uninitiated, the first-hand report is of great assistance to comprehension of the phenomenon. And if you're wondering when we last had this much rain in a single day, well, you'd have to go back more than two years to the 14th of September, 1993. While the storms brought havoc for this morning's commuters, it brought some relief for Sydney's water supply. With 30 knot winds gripping up enormous seas of 5 metres and more. With gale force winds of up to 50 knots sweeping across the harbour. Who says journalists know enough to come in out of the rain? Finally, Alan Jones answers those who dare accuse him of parroting anti-Semitism for Channel 9. The fact that Jews did kill Jesus, to them apparently is irrelevant. The apologia? The Jews, metaphorically at least, killed Jesus. Responsibility to me is a broad concept. Thank you and good night to you, Polly.